Good evening, and thank you all very much for coming out on this brutal winter night. Uh, on behalf of President Jennifer Rabb and uh, the Roosevelt House Director Harold Halzer, I want to welcome you to this evening. We have had many panels with a lot of intellectual firepower, but none with more intellectual firepower than we have here this evening. I'm really excited about this group. Uh, Carl Charles is a staff attorney in the New York office of Lambda Legal, who focuses on cases which expand and solidify the rights of transgender people. Most recently, he was counsel in Karnofsky versus Trump, a federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the Trump administration's ban on military service by transgender people. Demoya Gordon is a supervising attorney in the Law Enforcement Bureau of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, focusing on public accommodation and policing. She previously worked at Lambda Legal, where she engaged in impact litigation, policy advocacy, and public education on a range of issues affecting transgender and intersex people including discriminatory treatment in the criminal justice system. Chase Strangio is a member of the ACLU's LGBT and HIV project and has been the lawyer for Chelsea Manning and Amy Stevens and is part of the legal team representing Gavin Grimm in the Supreme Court. His work includes impact litigation as well as legislative and administrative advocacy on behalf of LGBTQ people and people living with HIV across the United States. And finally, we have my oldest friend, Stephen R. Shapiro, who for many, many years was the legal director of the ACLU, retired a couple years ago after being part of the legal team, which wrote more than 200 SCOTUS briefs, and he's now teaching simultaneously at our alma mater, Columbia, and NYU. And without further ado, we're going to play a very short three-minute excerpt from the oral argument of one of the cases that we will be discussing here this evening. I, I say um, that recognizing that transgender people have a right to exist in the workplace and not be turned away because of who they are does not end dress codes or restrooms. There are transgender lawyers in this courtroom today. Of course there and are. The That's not the question, Mr. No, Cole. Mr. This, Cole, the question is a matter of the judicial role and modesty in interpreting statutes that are old. And that's the question he posed. Right. Nobody is questioning, and he certainly did not, the legitimacy of the claims and the importance of them. So, so I think the question is a matter of judicial interpretation. Yeah, there's two, if you wish to address it. Two, two, two answers to that, Your Honor. First, on the question of judicial interpretation, we are not asking you to apply any meaning of sex other than the one that everybody agrees uh, on uh, as of 1964, which is sex assigned at birth, or as they, as they put it, biological sex. We're not asking you to re rewrite it. Second, I agree with that. Second, the question, though, again, I'm sorry to pose it, yeah. but I'm going to give you one more shot. Yeah. All right. When a case is really close, really close on the textual evidence, and I assume for the moment, I'm, I'm with you on the textual evidence, it's close, okay? We're, we're not talking about extra textual stuff, we're talking about the text, it's close. A judge finds it very close. At the end of the day, should he or she take into consideration the massive social upheaval that would be entailed in such a decision and the possibility that, that Congress didn't think about it so, and that, um, that that is a more, effect, more appropriate legislative rather than a judicial function? That, that's it. It's a question of judicial modesty. So, first of all, federal courts of appeals have been recognizing that discrimination against transgender people is sex discrimination for 20 years. There's been no upheaval. As I was saying, there are transgender male lawyers in this courtroom following the male dress code and going to the men's room, and the, 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 the court's dress code and sex segregated restrooms have not fallen. So the notion that somehow this is going to be a huge upheaval, we haven't seen that upheaval for 20 years. There's no reason to, you would see that upheaval. Transgender people follow the rule that's associated with their gender identity. It's not disruptive. Uh, and as to whether uh, this is a question of uh, interpretation, it is absolutely a question of interpretation. How in the world can the court interpret Title VII to say that Ann Hopkins can't be fired for being insufficiently feminine, but my client can be fired for being insufficiently masculine. There's no textual basis for drawing that distinction whatsoever, and that's because our argument rests on text meaning, at a minimum, sex assigned at birth, 
for biological sex, and everybody agreed. Did you want to address Judge Lynch's arguments or not? I, I thought I was. Number one, it won't, it's not disruptive that transgender people exist in this world and we still have sex-segregated dress codes. And number two, it's not asking you to address a policy question that would be more appropriate to Congress, but asking you to interpret the statute as it is written and as everybody agrees it applies to um, sex assigned at birth. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Chase, you were there for this argument. Would you tell us a little bit about the facts of the case and also why some people thought that what we just heard was the most hopeful moment in the whole argument. So Charlie, can I just begin by clarifying something yes. for the people in the audience who may not know it? The man to your right as you look at the screen uh, was Justice Neil Gorsuch of the Supreme Court, who improbably is now regarded as a possible fifth vote in favor of the um, uh, plaintiffs in the case, in favor of our side in the case. And that good-looking man on the left is uh, David Cole, who was arguing one of the two cases in the Supreme Court that day, and my successor is the legal director of the ACLU, just to explain who those people are. Thank All you. right, Chase. Um, yeah, so so thank you for having me, um, and thank you for re-traumatizing me with that clip. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know that that is a part of the argument in in Amy Stevens case which was heard on October 8th at the United States Supreme Court along with two other cases um, the facts of Amy's case are that um, she is a trans woman um, from Mis Michigan she was working um, for many years as a funeral director and embalmer um, at the time she wasn't out to herself you know in many ways as 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 a trans woman um, like, like many trans people like many of us she was you know struggling silently with the truth of, of who she is and and ultimately um, reached the conclusion that you know she's only has one life and she's going to live that life authentically um, and she came out to her wife and her wife was incredibly supportive um, and she started to to transition with the support of her family and her medical providers and decided to tell her employer um, who promptly um, after she uh, came out um, said you know I am Amy. She didn't say much. She she wrote a letter and said, "I'm Amy. Um, I I I hope to continue to come to work, doing my best work for you as Amy." And he, and her employer fired her. Um, and and this was in 2013. Obama was president. You might remember that time. Um, and uh, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, at the time um, was enforcing Title VII in such a way that was inclusive of LGBTQ people um, and brought the case on Amy's behalf. So the case is actually the, e the EEOC versus Harris Funeral Homes, um, which was her employer. Uh, we intervened, the ACLU intervened um, on appeal um, after the election because we were concerned um, that perhaps the Trump administration would no longer um, uh, you know, fully uh, defend Amy's rights under Title VII, which is the federal law that prohibits discrimination um, because of sex and employment. Um, and so we represented Amy um, before the United States Supreme Court the United States, unfortunately, um, sided, switched sides, um, and the Solicitor General argued on the side of the employers in favor of a restrictive interpretation of Title VII, which would permit LGBTQ people to be lawfully fired under federal law. Um, so those are the facts. I'm happy to also speak more, but I think we're getting the facts on the table first. Yeah, let me, let me before we turn it over to Carl, let me just provide a little context because we're going to begin by discussing this trilogy of cases that were argued in the Supreme Court on October 8th. They involve a provision of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was one of the landmark achievements of the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program. It, broadly speaking, prohibits discrimination in employment and public accommodations, public accommodations being hotels, restaurants, retail establishments. Um, the provision of the Civil Rights Act that bars employment discrimination is known as Title VII. Uh, as originally brought to Congress by the Johnson administration, it would have prohibited discrimination based on race, color, national origin, and religion. And the Southern senators who were desperately trying to defeat this civil rights bill came up with the strategy of adding a prohibition 
on employment discrimination because of sex, thinking that would kill the entire bill uh, because it was inconceivable that Congress would have voted in 1965 to prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sex. Lo and behold, Congress did. Uh, and so the bill that was then became law read that no employer above a certain size uh, may discriminate in employment because of race, color, national origin, religion, or sex. Um, and the issue in these cases that were argued in front of the Supreme Court on October 8th is whether the prohibition against employment discrimination because of sex also covers employment discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity. And a uh, whole lot of lower courts have ruled that it does, right? Well, a whole lot of lower courts have recently ruled that it does. For many years, they ruled that it did not. And of the three cases that were before the Supreme Court, one involved a trans woman who was fired from her job, which is the case that Chase just described. Two involved gay men who were fired from their jobs. And those are the facts that Carl is about to describe because I think it's just important when you're discussing these legal issues always to remember that there are actual people involved in these cases who lives, whose lives have been dramatically affected. And so, Carl, do you want to describe those cases? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And uh, thank you, Charles, for having me as well. Um, so the other two cases that were before the Supreme Court uh, as Steve said, were about uh, gay cisgender men who had been fired from their jobs because of their sexual orientation. Um, so the one of those cases is called Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia, uh, and uh, Gerald Bostock was uh, a, a city or state employee who had been uh, serving for about 10 years uh, in, in charge of the CASA program, which is the court-appointed special advocate working with uh, children, um, who were in the state juvenile system. Um, and he mentioned offhandedly to a coworker that he uh, participated in a gay softball league. Uh, and then his employer basically found some uh, pretext under which to fire him. Uh, so uh, he found private counsel in Georgia to represent him to challenge that firing um, under the law that Steve just explained, Title VII. Um, the district court ruled against him. The 11th Circuit ruled against him. Uh, and so they sought cert to the Supreme Court. Uh, the second case is Zarda v. Altitude Express. Um, uh, Donald Zarda was a, a uh, skydiving instructor uh, working for Altitude Express, which was a company based on Long Island, so here in the, in the New York metro area. Um, he was uh, working with a, a client, and uh, you know she had expressed some some discomfort about skydiving. Can't imagine why. Who jumps <laughs> out of a plane? Um, and to assuage some of her discomfort about the tandem dive that they were doing, which is where uh, you know my, uh, uh, Donald was strapped to her. Right. Um, he mentioned that he was gay and that you know she needn't worry about sexual harassment or feeling uncomfortable. Anyway, it was an offhanded remark, uh, and as a result of that, um, her boyfriend mentioned it to his employer. Uh, and then his employer summarily fired him. Um, uh, Donald then brought suit, uh, very similar to these other cases. Uh, the Eastern District of New York actually ruled against him. Um, but And then when the case was appealed to the Second Circuit, uh, a panel of three judges also ruled against him, but then they asked the entire Second Circuit, so what's called en banc review. Um, and, and the Second Circuit actually ruled in his favor and found that um, that that Title VII does prohibit discrimination in employment on the basis of sexual orientation. Is there no New York State statute on the covers some point of this? So they, yeah, what? so the, there's like a weird procedural history in Don's artist case, which I don't know that we need to necessarily get into, but it did go to trial under New York law, and then the Title VII claims remained because of a, a sort of what was the actual basis for firing. So just to be clear, like when it got to the Supreme Court, there was no question about the legal issue. It wasn't like, oh, you know, was it really because he was gay that he was fired or was it really because she was trans? It was sort of assuming it was, or in some cases it definitely was. Um, nobody disputed that. Then is that covered under Title VII? So there was a just, you know, a, a New York state law aspect of it. So I guess, I guess the, 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 the first question for a general audience is, so why is this so important? And 
Um, I did, in fact, I checked this with Chase, I did, in fact, read a quote from Chase saying this was the most important case affecting the LGBTQ community ever to reach the United States Supreme Court. Um, as his former boss, I explained to him he did not have to rank and rate them. Um, <laughs> there have been a series of important cases that have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but but what's what's the big deal? I mean, this is not just this is not just a fight among the lawyers. This is not just a fight that affects the individual clients who happen to be a, a peer before the Supreme Court. Uh, this is a, a critically important issue for this community, and 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 the question is 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 why? And so I don't know, Demoya, you want to. Do you feel comfortable answering that? What? Sure. Um, you know, I don't know um, what the mix we have in the audience tonight is, but um, I think most people here probably understand the importance of being able to earn a living, right? Um, and that goes to the heart of this. And I think most people here probably also understand that the LGBT community writ large is subjected to all kinds of discrimination and the workplace isn't exempted from that. And if you're thinking about people of color, LGBTQ people of color, that goes up even more, right? And so this is a hugely important issue for all of those reasons. Um, and as the ambassador for the New York City Commission on Human Rights, um, I do want I, I do want to say I have no crystal ball. I have no idea what this, how the Supreme Court is going to rule on this. Um, I, I know how I think they should rule. Um, you know, I'll, I'll channel my former colleague, Greg Nevins from Lambda Legal, who does a lot of work in this area um, and who often makes the point that the, the, the point, the, the argument that s discrimination based on sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity is not a radical one. It really isn't, right? And that's why we've seen lots of Republican leaning and conservative leaning and Republican appointed and straight up conservative judges um, in recent times holding just that. I think even a strict textual looking just at the text analysis of these issues leads to that event. And I think Gorsuch basically was saying that, but then trying to say like, you know, but, but social, you know, major social upheaval, um, which of which there hasn't been any. So I, so I, I know how I think they should rule, but I don't know how they will. Um, and I certainly don't want to downplay the potential effects of, you know, what I think most of us here would term the, the bad way for this to go. Um, I think it would, just the message of the highest court in the land saying under federal law, or you know, members of our communities can be fired. Um, just the impact of that alone, I think, um, certainly can't be understated, but other impacts, whether that's economic, health-wise, um, making people even more likely to be caught up in the criminal justice system because of increased discrimination. So many things you can think about that would come of basically a message saying to would-be discriminators, you can under federal law. Um, I would never want to understate that, but I do want to emphasize for folks, if you want to take a, some sliver of, of hope if things should go that way, you live in a city where you have some of the broadest protections, um, whether, you know, uh, whether you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, intersex, um, under the New York City Human Rights Law, which is one of the most protective statutes, anti-discrimination statutes in the country. It protects anyone who lives, works, or even visits the city on, at my last count, 24 different protected statuses, and it's always growing. So by next week, it'll be more. Um, but among those are sexual orientation and gender, and gender is explicitly defined to include gender identity and um, gender expression. So just, you know, just, just want to make sure that folks understand that. And are there a lot of cases in New York City that come to the commission that uh, allege firings on the basis of any of these things? Yes, yeah, so um, under the current commissioner, Carmelyn Malalis, um, she started in, in 2014. In the year before she started, uh, 2014, there were very few cases, certainly um, on the basis of gender identity that were filed with the commission. Um, and that number shot up substantially in 2015 in her first year. And I think that um, had a lot to do with the fact that as soon as she got in, she made this a priority. Um, she made a priority as a general matter to reinvigorate the agency, to make the agency live up to its mandate, to use the power of this really broad anti-discrimination law to protect everybody in the city. So I think that's part of it. Um, the outreach that was done in the beginning to make sure folks knew this is a place that you can come to for protection, I think that's part of it. In 2016, it jumped even more, and we all know what happened in 2016, right? So, and it's been sustained since then. 
Um, and I and I think given the background of everything that's happening at the federal level, um, it's local protections and there is a state human rights law as well. Um, and that's also very protective. I will say the New York City human rights law is the most protective law that you can be subjected to or protected under in the city. It is explicitly very broad and it's also meant to be interpreted very liberally and very broadly. Um, so yeah, we do have um, a good number of cases and they've been going up over the last uh, few years. Can I defend my statement too about um, the the most important? You're not my boss anymore, Steve. Um, so no, but uh, one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why I I made that statement in addition to trying to get people to care about the case, which feels very important in the in this time, is you know the it is true that it's been very re recently that federal courts have ruled that sexual orientation is covered under um, Title VII and other federal laws that prohibit discrimination because of sex. Trans people um, have been, you know, protected under federal interpretations of Title VII and other civil rights laws, you know, for close to 20 years. Um, and it's been the primary way that uh, trans um, and gender nonconforming people have been able to get protections under federal law, not just in the context of employment, but in the context of education, healthcare, housing, including access to shelter. And so the consequences of a loss would be to take away the primary tool that, that trans folks have been able to secure protections in the federal courts for close to 20 years. Um, you know, the first circuit court decision was in 2000. Um, and, and then you know, even more concerning and more broad was the fact that the employers and the Trump administration were really, you know, pushing an interpretation of Title VII that was so restrictive um, that would really potentially roll back even protections uh, extended to all, you know, not just trans people, but 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 cisgender people based on sex stereotypes. Um, and I really believe that there was an agenda um, that, uh, you know, I think the Solicitor General somewhat rolled it back it, during argument to attack a case called um, Price Waterhouse, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1989, which essentially said that prohibitions on discrimination because of sex encompass prohibitions on sex stereotypes. So the idea that an em employer could target you for being an insufficiently masculine man or an insufficiently feminine woman um, is also part of your federal protection. That there really was a desire, I think it's certainly on the part of the Alliance Defending Freedom, representing Amy's employer, um, to entrench an idea of federal law that was incredibly restrictive, that would allow for a whole host of discriminatory actions um, by government, which would have a lot of far-reaching consequences for trans people, particularly trans people of color, not just in employment, but in education, healthcare. Um, housing, shelter access. And so I, I think that the arguments that were being made and the potential consequences, both sort of formal quality consequences and material consequences for our community were so, are so significant um, that I had to be hyperbolic about it. So <laughs> I didn't say you were hyperbolic. Yeah. I would never <laughs> accuse you, Chase, of being hyperbolic. Uh, um, uh, but, um, but, but let me just come follow up on something that Chase just said, and again, just really for purposes of clarification for people who don't live with this every day the way people up here do. Uh, so New York City and New York State have both amended their anti-discrimination laws to specifically prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity, and roughly half the states, maybe you know the exact number, also have laws that specifically prohibit discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation. Federal law does not. So all federal law prohibits is discrimination because of sex, which is what has then led to this legal fight of whether that phrase, discrimination because of sex, includes gender identity How, and sexual however, orientation. However, the current House of Representatives has passed the Equality Act, which would solve all of these problems, I believe, by inserting, is that correct? Is that your understanding? I mean, y yes, I, the, so, so, the, so yes, I think the Equality Act, which is a piece of legislation that's pending um, in Congress, uh, would not only add sexual orientation and gender identity 
to existing civil rights law explicitly, it would also expand the scope of protections for everyone. So another thing about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title II um, is the public accommodations title, which, um, which uh, Steve alluded to in the beginning. It doesn't include sex at all, um, in part because people were concerned about what that would mean for bathrooms. Um, uh, and... And so the Equality Act, which is pending in the House and has no chance of moving in the current Congress because of the Senate and the President, um, would not only add sexual orientation and gender identity, um, both separately enumerated and as a part of the definition of sex, it would also expand not only the scope of protections for LGBTQ people, but also expand the definition of public accommodations generally under Title II and add sex to, um, to Title II um, of, the, of the Civil Rights Act. And I just wanted to add, 21 states, D.C., Guam, and Puerto Rico are the uh, jurisdictions where there are explicit protections for um, against employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So a, a lot of people think all states have that. Uh, that's actually not, not true. So. so one of the things that I think might be helpful, and anybody on the panel can answer this, and, and Chase, I think you started to answer this, but there's a certain, I think, response you get from people who may not have thought about this problem a lot that say discrimination against people because of sexual orientation and gender identity is a terrible thing, but it's different than discrimination because of sex. And that Bostock and Zarda were not fired because they were men, they were fired because they were gay, and Amy Stevens was not fired because she was a woman, she was fired because she's a trans woman. And so I think explaining the argument that says it really is all about sex um, and uh, is would be helpful, I think, in people trying to understand what the case is about. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> I feel very strongly about it. Um, and uh, does someone else want to, want me to start? And then I'll start. Um, so, you know, I, I think I will say first and foremost that like when you're litigating in the courts, there's just the reality of the limitations of the courts generally. And so, uh, you know, for me, it's always, you know, it's, it's, it's just the, the frustration of sort of how we have to, to be constrained and the law is very constrained. Um, so we can talk about sort of that at some point too. Um, but, you know, we, we have sort of relied on different ways of, of advancing these arguments. Um, and so there's two sort of fundamental ways of thinking about this, both in the sexual, orient context, sexual orientation context and in the, in the transgender status context. One, which is sort of what we heard, was sort of to really designed to appeal to people like Gorsuch, who are textualists, who are sort of just like, I don't care what the intent of the lawmakers was, like what, does the, the wor what do the words of the statute say? And under that sort of paradigm, w the argument seems very straightforward. So imagine that you have uh, a man named, you know, David, um, and David is married to um, Sue, and David is married to Sue, and he's fine, but if, da if another David is married to John, um, then that David gets fired, then it's, you know, but for um, that's not a good example, but so, uh, but it, it, that essentially it's the, you know, it's, it's, if it's only the fact that it's a man attracted to a man, um, that you, that you're, that you get fired. Um, but if you're a woman attracted to a man, you aren't fired. It's only the sex of the person that changed. And so the law essentially recognizes that but for a person's sex is sex discrimination, end of story. Um, so that's one way of thinking about the sexual orientation um, theory. In the trans context, um, you know, same applies. If you fire me because I am uh, assigned female at birth, but you don't fire a man who's assigned um, male at birth, it's only because of our sex assigned at birth. It's but for our sex. It's sort of a very straightforward, like sex is the only reason. Um, you can't actually talk about it without talking about sex. Um, that's one way of thinking about it. The other way um, that courts have thought about it and that we argue it is it's about sex stereotypes. And this is why the case of Ann Hopkins in 1989 is so important, which is that if you disapprove of someone for being gay, lesbian, or bisexual, um, for being, let's say, a man who's not exclusively attracted to women, it is based on the stereotype that men must be exclusively attracted to women. 
That is a stereotype. Um, and if you are discriminating against trans people because you believe that all women should be assigned female at birth and all men should be assigned male at birth, that is a stereotype about what makes a man and what makes a woman. Um, and so there's both the theory that it's just but for someone's sex, you can't even talk about sex, um, you can't talk about sexual orientation or transgender status without talking about sex. And there's the sex stereotyping argument, which is you know, fundamentally, dislike of and discrimination against LGBTQ people is based on the idea that we inherently depart from stereotypes about what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. And that is straightforward sex discrimination under federal law. Um, and so those were the arguments that have been successful in the lower courts, and those were the arguments you know, by and large, that were presented at the Supreme Court. Maybe someone yeah, can clarify and that. you know, I think under the New York City Human Rights Law, we look at it very much that way. I think there there is another theory, and I I don't know how much it's fi it's figured into the arguments around Bostock and Sarda um, for sexual orientation, and that's like an, an associational theory analyzed an analogizing to cases that had to do with interracial marriage. So, if a white person is married to a black person, their cases holding that if you fire someone for that reason, even though the person being fired is white, it's because of their association to someone of color while you're firing them, and that's discrimination based on race. Similarly, if you are firing a man because he's married to another man, that is sex discrimination. So there's that analogy and that theory as well, but the general idea that you can't talk about any of these things without referring back to the central thing, which in this case is sex, is also reflected in the way the commission approaches our work um, on what we call gender-based discrimination. And again, the, the analytical framework here is gender is the protected status and it's defined to include gender identity and gender expression and sexual orientation is also a protected status. And so we have an, a whole unit at the commission called the gender-based harassment unit and the cases that we that we see under that framework um, include cases of sexual harassment and the way that people typically think about that, you know, the typical kind of thing that comes into most people's imagination, which is a cisgender man sexually harassing a cisgender woman. That, of course, also clearly states the case, but discrimination against someone based on gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation also, in our view, is gender-based harassment. And that's important under our law because in order to file a complaint with the commission, you typically have to come to us within one year of the last discriminatory act, but under recently passed laws, that was expanded to three years for gender-based harassment. So anything that relates to gender or sex, you have three years to come and file um, um, with the commission. So Carl, maybe you can just take a moment and respond to what I think is the other big argument made by the, <clears throat> by the government in this case, by the, by the Trump administration, and that is to say, look, when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, they clearly were not thinking about either sexual orientation or transgender individuals, and I think that's undisputed. Um, and if we're gonna make this big change in the law, it ought to be made by Congress and not by the courts. That's what that clip that Charlie played at the beginning was talking about, judicial modesty, right? This is a big deal. It ought to be, it, it ought to be done if it's gonna be done by elected representatives and not by unelected judges. So what's, what's the response to that? Well, I think that's a little, uh, I, I always chuckle a little bit when that argument is made, primarily because it feels like people who are opposing equality and our arguments here um, for inclusion uh, say things like that when it's convenient for them and at other times, uh, uh, you know, they, they oppose it when it's not. And so, um, you know, I think, I, I think it was really interesting to me how many times Neil Gorsuch said close. You know, he said it's really close. It's really, really close. What he, I feel like, was admitting, and Chase was there so he can speak to this a little better, was that per his own jurisprudence over the course of his time as a jurist, he should find that the words of this statute include sexual orientation and gender identity for the reasons that Chase outlines, right? You literally cannot talk about LGBTQ people without talking about sex. It's what it is at its base. And even if Congress in 1964 didn't, wasn't explicitly contemplating the existence of transgender people or LGB people, um, that doesn't bar their understanding of, of that term now as being inclusive of, of LGBTQ people. So 
What about as a strategic question? Is it uh, going forward? Should we be putting most of our energy in the, the courts to make this happen, or should we be putting our energy in changing the legislatures in order to get these bills passed? Well, I'll, I'll leave the strategy question to, to Chase on that, but um, I think also n none other than Justice Scalia has addressed this, yeah. right? I mean, he has clearly said that it's not what was in legislators' minds that should control us. It's the text of the law, right? So the fact that in 1964, for example, um, Congress didn't, didn't anticipate when they passed this law covering same-sex sexual harassment, which Justice uh, Scalia talked about in a case called On Call versus Sundowner Shore Service. I don't remember the rig. rest of it. But um, it was a man on an oil rig who was subjected to really just bad sexual harassment um, by other male um, co workers. And his case got all the way up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, the argument on the, on the side against him was. Congress had no conception of this. Like the, the Title VII shouldn't reach this. And what Justice Scalia said was, "We're not bound by um, the just the principal evil. Evil is such a Scalia word, but he says it's not just the principal evil that Congress had in mind, but similar evils. It also extends to similar evils, and we are controlled not by what was in their minds, but by the text of the statute. And so that's why Gorsuch, I think, as you know, if he's a student of Scalia." I think he was kind of admitting that he has to come out a certain way. His escape valve, maybe, um, if he doesn't want to rule the right way, is this idea of social upheaval for which there really is, is no basis. And no exception to textualism for massive social upheaval. But I think, yeah, the point that, you know, essentially that, you know, in most of the court Title VII cases, you know, because the same-sex sexual harassment case, but also the different sex sexual harassment case, it was at the time that the court ruled in a case called Meritor versus Vincent saying that sexual harassment between men and women or, you know, of women by men at the time was, was covered was a huge deal. At the, you know, in 1964, that was just part of, of life. I don't think that any of the lawmakers would have expected that uh, by passing uh, the Civil Rights Act that they would be prohibiting that. And all of the lower courts at that time had had ruled that it was not covered. Um, and so I think that that, you know, is an important counterpoint. And then I will answer your question, Charles, but I do want to add one other thing, which I thought was, was, was interesting. At the argument, both Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor said, well, in 1964, the intent of the legislature what the intent of Congress was to root out discrimination. And so you could sort of look at intent, at, you know, in a number of different ways um, and that they certainly understood, um, you know, sort of aspects of sex to be broader than what, you know, the Solicitor General of the United States and what um, ADF were getting up and saying was sex. Um, so I think there are sort of, you could flip the congressional intent argument. I don't think that's our best bet, um, particularly trying to, uh, to, to get Gorsuch as a, as a fifth vote, but there are other ways to think about it as there always are with the law. I think in terms of what is the st strategic question, I mean, I think the strategic point, you know, goal from my perspective is to do it all. I mean, I, I think we have to fight in the courts. We have to fight in Congress. We can't forget the local fights. Um, we can't give up on the courts because they're dealing with the constitutional questions that we can't legislate our way out of. Um, so from my perspective, it's it's an all hands on deck time. It's a time to um, use every tool that, that you possibly can. I mean, the Equality Act is one answer, but we have to remember that we're living in a time where the second they pass the Equality Act, they're gonna find a favorable jurisdiction um, to challenge it, and they're gonna get a nationwide injunction in the Northern District of Texas. Um, so we're sort of living in a time where, um, you know, we are gonna make progress, but but ultimately we're gonna have to think of creative and new ways to utilize every branch of government to, uh, and not to mention sort of public mobilization to actually secure the progress that we make. And then we have the additional problem of the new regulations of the Health and Human Services Department. Can you describe what the effect of they them would be? What? But Steve, did you want to add? No, no, no. Go ahead. It's not, I, I've been talking a lot. You want to talk about the HHS word? No. <laughs> um, well, so another, I mean, another aspect of one of the reasons why this case is so important, and one of the reasons why um, I would. 
I feel so strongly about the the sort of material impact of it is because the way in which, so for example, the Obama administration was able to do so much was because the executive agencies um, under Obama promulgated regulations under a theory that sex included uh you know, LGBTQ people um, and that discrimination on the basis of sex or because of sex sort of encompassed discrimination against our communities uh, and against, you know, people who have access to abortion and reproductive health care and other things, um, you know, so was was part of this sort of expansive protections we were able to get under Obama, um, including in the context of the Affordable Care Act's non-discrimination provisions, um, very uh, sort of robust, explicit protections implementing the Affordable Care Act that included health care protections for trans people that were incredibly transformative um, in our ability to, to access care. Um, of course, once Trump came into office, they systematically went about in every executive agency context trying to undo the, the, the protections that the Obama administration had put into place. One of the most recent things they did was, rep was sort of do a wholesale um, uh, rep repeal, essentially, um, of the Affordable Care Act regulations, which uh, they didn't... Um, so there's a lot of misinformation about this. And, and so because... A year ago, I don't know if folks remember, the New York Times had a big headline that was like, Trump administration tries to write transgender out of existence. Right. Um, and what that was about was, was about a proposal within the Health and Human Services um, Agency to, to essentially define sex within... Um, within the regs um, when they were uh, repealing and replacing the Obama regs to mean quote unquote biological sex. That didn't happen um, with the proposed regs in part because these questions are now pending before the Supreme Court. But what has been proposed is a whole, uh, essentially a wholesale repeal of the um, really robust explicit protections that had been put into place. Um, and so I think what we could see, um, you know, both with the final regs under the, the HHS rule, um, as well as future regs, if Trump were to be reelected and the court were to rule against us in the Title VII cases, would be um, even more uh, regressive regulations that would not only sort of suggest that trans people aren't covered under um, the existing Affordable Care Act provision, but actually explicitly prohibit protections um, in, in, in even more um, damaging ways. So right now we're sort of in, in limbo um, and there is no final rule, but this is just one of the ways in which the administrative state is, is targeting our communities. So this may be too big a question to raise as we are getting close to the Q&A part of this program, but I'm just, as, as Chase said, law is very constraining in many ways. I mean, it's designed to constrain people's behavior, but it also constrains the kinds of arguments that you can make. And so in this particular case, the statute regrettably says nothing expressly about sexual orientation or gender identity, so the argument has to be that is covered within the phrase discrimination because of sex. That's the argument that's available, and that's the argument that, that is made. I'm just wondering if anybody sees any tension between that legal argument and, and a broader political strategy of submerging the advocacy on behalf of the LGBT community into a, a broader and, and, and more encompassing you know, struggle for equality. I mean, it, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's. I, I think any category of law and any sort of formal equality framework is equally constraining. I don't feel any better about sort of gender identity as a category or sexual orientation as a category. I think we end up losing a lot when we make demands of of the state. We sort of, you know we have to say that someone intentionally discriminated against us and then prove it, which is incredibly difficult. So I, I, I don't feel that, I didn't feel that that was necessarily the cost. Um, I, I do think there are ways where, you know, looking at the progression of cases before the Supreme Court, you know, it's just, it is a set of conservative demands, you know, from, from marriage equality to um, sort of a very uh, binary notion of sort of how trans people might be protected um, uh, to, you know, talking about sexual orientation in a context where barely anyone ever mentioned bisexual people in the context of the public discourse of the case. So I think it just shows the ways in which we sort of, 
inherently lose parts of our community. Um, so that that's to me, it's it's a law sort of forcing us into these boxes that then feels counter to some of the more um, robust and transformative political demands, um, but not necessarily sex versus the explicitly enumerated categories. We will take questions from the floor. Five, um, at this relatively early uh, stage granted in the presidential race, do you have a candidate? Who is it and why? <laughs> okay, well, I want to say Julian Castro is severely underrated, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to endorse any particular candidate, but I will say that um, his campaign is led by a really incredible black queer woman named Maya Rupert, um, and I consistently, consistently see uh, Miss. Mr. Castro, um, uh, talking about, and not just talking about, but um, listening to a lot of folks in this country who have historically been not listened to and marginalized. He spent a considerable amount of time with incarcerated people. He's doing, he, he has an incredible disability rights platform. I, I, I'm, I, again, this is not an endorsement. I'm just saying um, I'm taking up space right now <laughs> on this question to say that um, I think he's really impressive. I think it's a real travesty that he's not gonna be on the debate stage uh, coming up um, because I think he's got some great ideas. I'm excited about Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and uh, not least because he has the one solution that could get us out of the current uh, conundrum of the United States Supreme Court, which is that he favors considering ways to expand the membership of the Supreme Court, which even though Franklin Roosevelt, who lived here, failed to do that, I don't think that should mean that we should never try to do it again. I'm gonna pass. <laughs> <laughs> I think as a government employee, I <laughs> have to pass as well. Well, I know who I'm against, and he's sitting in 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue at the moment. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm waiting to see how this process plays out. I don't have a candidate yet. Hi. Um, so I work with a community-based nonprofit. We, we interact with trans people regularly. And my question for the lawyers is, um, is this, and I, I get why this is kind of incendiary. Why, for members of the trans community, does this actually matter? How, what will be the actual impact on trans people's lives if this goes through? Love what y'all do, by the way. Big fan. Well, I think as Chase talked about, there's a lot of limitations to formal equality, and we recognize that the, the law can really only afford us so much protection. Um, and uh, out in the world, things will happen regardless of what the law says. However, um, I think Chase said this earlier, um, if this decision comes down against us, um, that's that sends a message, right? It's not a permission slip, but it does send a message to people across the country um, about the value of, of transgender people in their lives. And um, I think we're seeing this rhetoric in a lot of places, right? So for example, um, I'm working on Lambda Legal's case against the trans military ban. I, am, am I um, a lover of the military? Do I support necessarily all the things we do? Absolutely not. But this rhetoric that's being used to exclude and dismiss and frankly kill people um, uh, across the country um, is something that we, we can't abide. And so, um, you know, I think I, I think all of us up here on this panel, not speaking for all of us, but I think we all recognize the limitations of the law and that it's imperfect and it will never serve us in the ways we want. But um, it's all it's what we have. Like Chase said, we have to use all the tools available to us, um, and I think that uh, we have to fight as hard as we can in every venue possible um, to ensure that trans people are uh, protected and and lifted up and that our lives are centered. Um, it's it's a fight worth fighting, I think. And and just to add to that, I think it's a it, from my perspective, this is a a sort of harm reduction tool, which is you know if we if we lose this case, some of the things I think we could we could lose, um, you know, 
which could be fixed by Congress potentially, are you know a new administration coming in and not being able to as easily implement regulations that would ensure Medicaid access, for example. So the Affordable Care Act, you know, in some states are able to like New York, we're able to get rid of Medicaid exclusion. Some states, you know, p individuals are going to have to do that through, um, potentially through litigation or because of affirmative regulations that the federal government issues, um, which could increase Medicaid access for trans people um, that is not uh, with, not with an exclusion of coverage for transition-related care. Shelter access is another. So, um, you know, if the, the Fair Housing Act also has a discrimination because of sex provision. So um, there are, you know, there are ways to promulgate regulations protective of people, even if we lose these cases. And I don't want to say, you know, all hope is lost. But I think there are sort of material things, particularly in states that don't have protections, um, where a loss will actually take away the ability. Under the Trump administration, we're not getting much, clearly. Um, but I do think it will sort of really hinder what people are going to be able to get under a new president, potentially, from the executive, um, and, then, uh, and then being able to enforce their rights through litigation, which is in and of itself limited. I would say the regulatory aspects are, are sort of more um, sort of tangible in terms of material distributive impact across the country. Um, so, Brown v. Board of Edu Brown v. Board of Education was argued by Justice Thurgood Marshall when he was a private attorney or working for the NAACP, and the Title VII and a lot of the sex discrimination cases was argued by Justice Ginsburg. Um, and kind of what I'm trying to get at there is that they were both deeply affected by the cases they were arguing. And in the um, Harris Funeral Home case. There was a cis man arguing the case. Should we have had a trans person arguing that case before the Supreme Court? I mean, this is something that I, you know, I, as a trans person on the team, I, you know, I, I think yes, and I'm. I don't think the identity of the person arguing is the only thing that matters. Um, you know, I think one of the you know, it, from my perspective. We have a serious problem with a lack of trans litigators litigating trans cases, and it's been a problem for a really long time, and there's lots of reasons for it. It's really hard to be a trans person litigating, um, and as someone who does litigate and has gone and like read the transcripts of my arguments in cases where judges are like telling me that trans people don't exist, you know, it's like, I'm like, oh, I see why this is really challenging, and I think that we do have, um, you know, a lot of work to do to build the bench, so to speak, um, of people. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I, yes, and the court, you know, I'm like, w w w it depends what our, w w you know, I, yes, we should. And like, we have a serious problem when all nine justices like have no idea what it means to be trans and that would not have been remedied by a trans person arguing. Um, and especially in a 30 minute argument. So I, from my perspective, it's like, yes, it's an important question and we need to have the, the answer be, we have a lot of trans people who could do a Supreme Court argument. I think unfortunately the direction of the Supreme Court bar is moving away from um, you know, diverse representation generally. Um, and and so I think that my my, what I want to see are more, um, you know, trans lawyers generally, trans litigators litigating trans cases, and um, you know, nine justices of the court having, you know, the ability to understand what it means to be trans a little more than than where we're at. Can and you? I, I'm sorry. Can you hazard a guess of how many trans people were present in the courtroom during this argument? Um, I could count. Uh, <laughs> I. I think probably in the courtroom there was probably about 12 out trans people, um, some of whom were lawyers. Right. Go ahead. Oh, and I was just gonna say, I, I, I agree with Chase, and also I would add, I was really struck by, and we heard it on the recording, the, the dismissiveness from Justice Gorsuch, and, and, and I presume maybe unspoken from other justices when David Cole tried to alert him to the humanity of, of the people in the courtroom, um, he was so dismissive. And so I worry about setting a trans person, any trans person up there for the purposes of trying to inject some humanity into this very short argument and having them be on the receiving end of that. I mean, 
I was listening to it and was like, good God, I was not even present. And I can't imagine how that would have felt to people. And and not to say there weren't um, qualified trans folks who could have been standing at that podium, um, but also putting them there for that, for the purpose of injecting humanity, I'm not sure how effective it would have been. And, and I'm not sure it would have outweighed the damage done to them having to like see and hear that in a really um, pernicious way. I, I agree with the general sentiment that there's a there's a pipeline issue. There's an issue of making sure that there's more trans people who are attorneys and who are litigators to begin with. I think it was clear that none of the justices maybe even knew or knew that they knew any trans people. Um, so, you know, let's start there. I mean, I remember reading an article about the marriage equality cases and about Kennedy, and it was like a super flowery piece about how, you know, he, he had a gay friend. And, you know, not to put too much on that, but I think that that's a big, that's a big part of it. So, I, you know, we were talking about this case of the commission the morning after, and one of the questions we were at, like, do they even have any clerks who are trans like have they ever like it's just so clear how removed they are and so I, I really do think that it behooves you know all of us to you know do our part in making sure that the bar is is more diverse as a general matter and I think that will hopefully obviate some of the the other concerns including like you know putting a trans person in front of a pretty hostile bench yeah, and I, I think just one other point, um, you know, in Gavin's case, which was a case that was a, a case about a trans boy who, who was excluded from the boys' restroom because he's trans, and it went up to the Supreme Court. They ultimately didn't hear argument, but in that case, one of the things that we did was have an amicus brief, which is a, a brief that's not by one of the parties, but it's called a, like a friend of, of the court brief where, where non-parties can, can weigh in, and we just had a, a brief of sort of trans people um, saying, you know, we exist, and we're doctors, and we're lawyers, and, and part of it, it, it was modeled after a brief that was filed in Whole Women's Health, which was an abortion case that is being relitigated now um, of legal professionals um, who have had abortions, and 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 that a, a version of that abortion brief was just filed again last week, and I urge everyone to read it. Um, and part of the point of these types of briefs is to say to the court, like there are people that exist in your world that are impacted by um, your actions, and and sort of we know that they know that on a theoretical level, but I do think there's a real benefit of of inserting that into the cases, and there's lots of ways to do it. Obviously, the identity of the oralist is, is one way. I think it's probably one of the most limited ways. Um, I think there's a lot of others, and so trying to be creative about that also has played into these lots of vague civil rights cases. Um, because, you know, the DACA cases, you know, were not, were, were argued by SCOTUS, you know, big shots. Um, they're, they're, this, is a, this is sort of how it goes a lot of the time more so than it did when Justice Ginsburg argued and, and when, ju when Justice Marshall argued. We have time for one more. I, I just have a question. Why, why don't we really talk about the history of all this? Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't we talk about um, um, the, the ENDA Act in, 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 in 97? I realize it didn't include transgender people, but I mean, we, we almost passed that. I was in DC at the time volunteering with HRC we only missed that by one vote, um, and we let it drop. I mean, Gore was there. Vice President Gore was there to cast the deciding vote, and Blunt from Arkansas didn't show up. So, I, I mean, it's we have it. We have a, a, a rich history of Congress before the courts not not seeing our our point of view, and also when you say it's a majority for covered, if it's 21 states, it's a, it's a it's a minority. And I understand that that number has gone down since Trump has been elected. Isn't that true? I mean, wasn't it more than 21 before Trump was elected? Not that I know of. I thought it was up around 20. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a majority, but it was. But it was more. The number of states has ha, has has remained the same, and actually, New York expanded protections for for trans folks since there are more municipalities yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. But. but there, yeah. No, no. I was just gonna say there's more municipalities now. Actually, um, uh, if you look at um, uh, there's there's a couple of great m map is one of them. The Movement Advancement Project. They've got uh, several different maps of the United States where you can see which states and cities have coverage. But I, I think the state number has stayed the same. 
Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, the other side uses the ENDA example against us, saying, right. well... Yeah, I mean, so the, I mean, it, we, it, it, you know, so the other side says, well, look, Congress has failed to to p include these protections, which shows they don't want to, which shows that, um, you know, it, it, you know, these failed legislative proposals show that the law is not in, intended to include people. I mean, there's a, another side to the argument, which is, well, they failed because we're already covered. Um, you know, it's you don't need to add sexual orientation because we're already covered under sex, and I think that's. That's why we go to the courts too, um, and that the the if you if you can't be fired because of your sex, you cannot be fired because you're a man attracted to men, and that's that's should be and has been the way the courts have um, interpreted it. So, um, but certainly the question of what Congress has done or not done has figured heavily into the into the litigation, and I think going back to the question of what is the ultimate strategy. Um, you know, it's you know, you know it, it makes a big difference who's the governor. It makes a big difference who's in Congress. It makes a big difference who's the president. And so it's it's all of those things. And I remind you, we did pass the House did pass this law already this year. If we controlled the Senate and the White House, it could become law, which is not inconceivable a year from now. Please give our panel a round of applause and come upstairs for a glass of wine.